So far, we've talked very little about foreign affairs, and one reason for that is that in the late 19th century, uh, foreign policy was not a major concern to most of the American people. But that would change rather dramatically beginning in the 1890s and the early 20th century. The leading American expansionist prior to the 1890s was William H. Seward, who served as Secretary of State under both Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson. Seward was largely responsible for the acquisition of Midway Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and his greatest triumph as an expansionist came with the purchase of Alaska from Russia in 1867. The purchase price of $7.2 million, or less than two cents an acre, proved eventually to be the greatest bargain for the United States economically and strategically since the Louisiana Purchase. But at the time, the deal was widely ridiculed as Seward's Folly, Seward's Icebox, or Seward's Polar Bear Garden. After Seward left office, American interest in overseas expansion continued to be haphazard. U.S. expansion during the 1870s and 1880s had two main characteristics. First of all, it was almost entirely interested in markets, not in land, and it moved along not one but many routes to all corners of the earth. What motivated American expansionists? To some extent, Americans were motivated by Europe's example. The late 19th century was the great age of empire for the European powers. The European powers carved up virtually all of the African continent into colonies and acquired huge chunks of territory in Asia and the Pacific as well. To some extent, the West was America's empire in the age of empire, but as the continental United States began to fill up, a lot of Americans began to look overseas as well. The economic motive was certainly paramount, uh, the desire to have guaranteed access to raw materials, but for the United States especially, the desire to have greater access to world markets. There was also the religious and humanitarian motives. A lot of American Christians wanted to spread the gospel to other parts of the world, and a lot of Americans wanted to spread the benefits of the advanced technologies that the West now offered. Racism also played a role. This was a period in which social Darwinism and similar attitudes were quite common. The belief that some races, as they were then defined, or nationalities were clearly more fit for survival than others and therefore had a right to dominate those that were less fit. For policymakers, though, in the United States, the strategic motive was probably paramount. And uh, the naval officer Alfred Thayer Mahan was especially influential in this regard. Mahan published a book that was widely read in the United States and elsewhere, arguing that the great powers were all sea powers. And so he urged the United States to begin to look outward and to expand its navy. And as part of that, Mahan also said that the United States would need to acquire strategically located colonies that could be used as naval bases. American imperialism reached full flower with the coming of the war with Spain in 1898. The Spanish-American War of 1898 was touched off by events in Cuba. Cuba was an island that had long interested the United States, partly because it is less than 100 miles from Havana to Key West, Florida. And if it had not been for the controversy over slavery, the United States might well have acquired Cuba one way or another prior to 1860. Now in the late 1890s, the island was in full rebellion against its Spanish rulers. Most Americans were sympathetic to the cause of the Cuban revolutionaries and were outraged by the efforts of the Spanish to put down the Cuban insurrection. The Spanish government sent General Valeriano Weiler to put down the rebellion and General Weiler adopted a policy of reconcentration, which meant driving the entire population of large areas of Cuba, including women, children, and old people, into cities and towns fortified with barbed wire and under armed guard. In the absence of proper food and hygienic precautions, uh, Cuban civilians died by the tens or even hundreds of thousands. The horrors of the reconcentration camps were real enough, but they were played up by the American press, which was undergoing a revolution of its own. Late in 1895, wealthy young William Randolph Hearst 
purchased a failing newspaper, the New York Journal, and revitalized it by using such devices as a lurid style, reckless liberties with the truth, imaginative illustrations, and screeching headlines. This brought the journal into a circulation war with Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, which up until that time had been unchallenged in the field of sensational journalism, or what was then called yellow journalism. Today, I suppose we'd call it tabloid journalism. The Cuban Revolution was tailor-made for the Hearst and Pulitzer papers. Both sent batteries of reporters and illustrators to Cuba with orders to provide accounts of atrocities committed by, on the orders of Butcher Weiler. The President of the United States at this point was William McKinley, uh, who was the last Civil War veteran to be elected president. Even though he had been elected in 1896 on a platform advocating Cuban independence, McKinley did not want to have to resort to war in order to bring that about. For one thing, uh, McKinley had fought as a young man at the Battle of Antietam in September of 1862, the bloodiest single day of the American Civil War, and as he told a friend, I have been through one war, I have seen the dead piled up, and I do not want to see another. Unfortunately uh, for McKinley's efforts to reach a peaceful resolution in Cuba, a series of events in early 1898 uh, propelled the two countries toward war. On February 9, 1898, Hearst newspaper published the text of a letter written by the Spanish ambassador to Washington. The letter was intended for a friend, but was stolen by a Cuban spy who turned it over to the journal. In this letter, uh, the Spanish ambassador Dupuy de Lome described President McKinley as weak. Now, McKinley's own assistant secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, had already said that McKinley has no more backbone than a chocolate eclair, so McKinley was used to being insulted, but coming from a foreigner, this was considered an insult to the nation. Then on February 15, 1898, the American battleship Maine, which was in Havana Harbor on a supposedly friendly visit, blew up and sank with a loss of 260 officers and men. A naval court of inquiry determined that an external explosion had been responsible, but the actual cause of the tragedy has never been determined, though most people today think that it was an accident. Even if it were sabotage, it is highly unlikely that the Spanish would have committed such an act, so nearly certain to bring U.S. intervention in Cuba. But at the time, most Americans blamed Spain for the destruction of the Maine, and remember the Maine and the hell with Spain became the popular rallying cry. In April of 1898, under increasing pressure, um, McKinley conceded uh, and Congress passed a joint resolution authorizing the use of force to drive the Spanish from the island of Cuba. And uh, so basically the, what is now known as the Spanish-American War of 1898 uh, began in late April of that year. The Spanish-American War was America's shortest and in some ways most popular war. Declared in April, it was over in August. It was the last small individualistic war before the huge protracted impersonal struggles of the 20th century. John Hay, who served as Secretary of State, uh, called it a splendid little war. However, it was not so splendid for the several thousand American soldiers who died of disease, as opposed to less than 500 actually killed in combat, or for the Spanish who lost what was left of their once mighty empire. While the roots of the war lay in Cuba, America's most smashing victory came on the other side of the globe. Just a week after war was declared, Commodore George Dewey led the Asiatic squadron of the U.S. Navy out of port in Hong Kong and into Manila Bay in the Spanish-owned Philippine Islands. At daybreak on May 1, 1898, Dewey turned to the captain of his flagship, the USS Olympia, and said, you may fire when ready, Gridley. Fire Gridley did, and when the firing was over, the entire Spanish fleet of 10 ships was at the bottom of Manila Bay, along with 381 Spanish sailors. The Americans lost no ships and only eight men wounded. One American sailor died during the Battle of Manila Bay, but he died not of Spanish gunfire, but of a heat stroke. The heat was so intense that a lot of the gunners inside the gun turrets had stripped off all their clothes. So it was a smashing victory for the United States right at the beginning of the war in the Philippines. 
The U.S. also won a swift and total victory in Cuba, despite very poor organization on the part of the U.S. War Department. Unfortunately for the United States, uh, Spain was a decrepit power, and so despite uh, poor leadership and near disastrous organization on the part of the United States, uh, Cuba was rather easily secured. Among those who fought in Cuba were Theodore Roosevelt and his volunteer cavalry unit, the Rough Riders, although they actually went into battle on foot because the men were deposited at one location while the horses were sent elsewhere. Two regiments of African-American soldiers, the 9th and 10th U.S. Cavalry, also saw significant combat. And even a few Confederate veterans from the Civil War, including uh, Senator Joseph Wheeler of Georgia, uh, went back into U.S. service and saw combat in Cuba. On August 12, 1898, Spain signed an armistice agreeing to get out of Cuba and to cede Puerto Rico and the Pacific island of Guam to the United States. The future of the Philippines was to be settled at a formal peace conference convening in Paris on October 1st. 